welcome to a very special cover story interview. We have joining us Nalin Mehta, who just out with his latest book, uh, The New BJP. In fact, uh, as the subtitle of the book says, it is uh, Modi and the making of the world's largest political party. So he's not just talked about the, you know, how in fact uh, the BJP came into being, how the not just the marketing strategies, but also the idea behind it, how uh, Modi has actually helped build, uh, the, you know, refashion the BJP and how he's taken this idea, made it a huge India's largest political party, how he's, uh, his thoughts and how he's marketed his thoughts, how he's sold his thoughts, and also the philosophy and the economy. It's very interesting because Nalan has already provoked some kind of a controversy by saying that uh, Modi is the new Nehru, you know, in terms of he's actually uh, achieving all that Nehru tried to do, uh, how the economy of the BJP is actually to, uh, not to really right, but is taken it left with his focus on welfareism and so on and so forth. But let me welcome Nalin uh, to the conversation before I go on and on about the book. Uh, congratulations, Nalin. It's a huge achievement and it's a really well argued, well written book and easy to read. That's what I like. You know, it's very accessible to someone who's not also into politics. So Nalin is a social scientist. He's also so the Dean at the School of Modern uh, Media at UPS. Uh, welcome, Nalin, to this conversation. Thank you very much, Priya. Um, delighted to be here and, and to have a chat with you. Always followed your program. So lovely we're having this conversation here. I'll begin with, you know, asking you the premise of the book, the new BJP is very interesting. So just for a layperson, how is the new B Modi's BJP different from Vajpayee's BJP? I assume that is the old hmm. BJP. A lot of people have asked me this question, Priya. In fact, somebody asked me the other day, uh, why have you called it the new BJP? Why not the real BJP? Why not the old <laughs> BJP? Um, and why new? So I think the answer to that question really is that um, uh, this BJP under Mr. Modi is fundamentally different from what came before, including under Mr. Vajpayee, on a number of different counts. Uh, the BJP as you know, has had many phases of evolution. I mean, there was the Jansung phase, the predecessor of the BJP, which lasted till 1980, from 1951 to 80. 1980, when the BJP comes to power, the Times of India had a headline saying, vegetarian but tasty party. Um, uh, but, you know, there was a phase from 1980 to about late 80s, where which was the next phase of the BJP, where they adopted Gandhian socialism, which a lot of people didn't understand, including many people within the BJP itself. That was phase one of this BJP uh, in its in the form in its form as the BJP. Um, phase two, I think, was um, when they adopted the Palampur resolution for the construction of the Ram Temple, and that led its growth from two party two seats in 1984 to a significant number of seats, um, and 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 that lasted until the late 90s, and then it led to the BJP becoming the single largest party. Mr. Vajpayee coming to power as the head of the coalition and so on, and then the BJP loses power in 2004, as we all know. I think this BJP after 2014 is different from that BJP for three or four reasons. The first is the old BJP was always um, seen as an uh, urban middle class dominated uh, uh, um, uh, party of upper caste and, and a Brahmin Banya kind of party. Uh, that's one. Um, the second was that it was um, so this in this BJP, number one, uh, the, uh, it is being led by uh, in the Hindi heartland by a huge ruralization of the BJP. In fact, uh, which is completely opposite to the earlier perception that this was only really an urban party of the middle classes. Um, in fact, we show in the book that between 2014 to 9, 2019, the data shows us, this is not just about rural seats won, but the num how the vote share increases, that 40% vote share in a, in a multi-party thing is a very good benchmark psychologically to say when a party starts consistently getting 40% vote share in those seats, it is either the main fulcrum or one of the two fulcrums of politics in, in that seat, whether it wins it or not. And that between 14 and 19 in the rural, we map the rural seats in the 10 Hindi speaking states of the Hindi heartland and in UP in particular, which is at the uh, vanguard of the BJP's advances. Um, there is no question that the BJP has become the default rural party of the Hindi heartland in the last five years. One. Second is on the question of upper caste. Um, and that's also led to this huge debate with Christoph Jaffarlo and Ashoka University's data, which you which you alluded to. Um, there is a view in academic scholarship that, uh, in fact, Jaffarlo has argued that uh, the advances between 14 and 19, he's termed them as the revenge of the upper caste, if you like. And they've argued that there's a huge resurgence of upper caste in the BJP's representation among MPs between 14 and 19. And that's what led to these great triumphs. Um, when we looked at this data, we created the Mehta Singh Index, which studied four and a half thousand politicians in UP over a 30 to 40 year period. And we looked at the social profiles. We looked at five categories, MPs, um, uh, the tickets given by the BJP, by four parties, BJP, SP, BSP, 
and uh, uh, and the Congress um, in uh, to the in the Lok Sabha election of 2019 and 14. We looked at the tickets given by them uh, by these parties in the Vidhan Sabha election of 2017, with the BJP uh, swept. We also looked at um, uh, the BJP's district level presidents. There are 98 district level presidents in UP. There are less lesser districts, but in many districts there are more than one. So there are 98 district presidents. And we also looked at the ministers under Akhilesh Yadav in the previous government and under Yogi uh, Yogi What we found, Priya, was that upper caste remained with BJP, but the representation of OBCs significantly went up to become the single largest category. Um, to just give you a... So I think uh, BJP a, has the single largest ministers for, from the OBC in the Yes, UK. absolutely. More than and some other party. And, and, yes, and on five counts, if you look at the Lok Sabha, Lok Sabha candidates in 2019, if you combine OBC and SC, 57.5% were OBC or SC. If you look at the Vidhan Sabha elections of, of uh, uh, 2017 among BJP candidates, 528 were OBC or SC candidates. Uh, the office bearers in UP were 50% OBC or SC. Uh, ministers under Yogi, OBC and SC are 48.1%, which is more than what it was under Akhilesh. Uh, and then district presidents about 35.6%. Now, this is very different from, this is not an upper caste resurgence. This is a huge social shift in representation among OBCs and that's driven this new BJP. Um, the other point I want to then make... Why are the OBCs leaving the BJP? I think we've had 10 OBCs yeah. legislators, including yeah. three ministers leave in the last month itself. I think that's a good question. And see, we looked at the data up till 2019. Uh, what we are not arguing, I have not argued that this is a social revolution of a kind at, at every level. Uh, what I've shown is that what happened between 14 and 19 is significantly different in the BJP from, uh, compared to what came before in the BJP, one, and significantly different from other political parties in UP. Now, um, uh, now, when you get so many people into your tent, there will always be dissension because now there, there are jostles for control and so on. There will always be that dissension. Um, the, but while you have seen some OBC leaders leaving the BJP and, and the BJP is now trying to, to make amends for that and, and, and trying to get other people in, the fact of the matter is, this is not, you know, this is different from an earlier kind of politics for one reason. Because, see, earlier, it's not like BJP didn't have OBC leaders earlier. Kalyan Singh was the first great OBC leader. Uma Bharti was OBC. When the Babri Masjid was demolished, he was the chief minister of, of Uttar Pradesh. The earlier model was that you get these totem pole leaders, which is the older Congress model, and you assume that your larger community will then follow you and come, come into the fold. In this model, what we have shown is, this is not just about totem pole leaders. This is goes, This goes down to representation down to the lowest booth level organization. So the BJP, for example, has 21 member Karikaranis at every level of organization, at the booth level, at the district level, at the state level, and so on and so forth. In each of these committees, in every district and at every booth, uh, they reserved seats about out of 21, five were reserved for women, and, uh, and another uh, nine or 10 were reserved for OBCs and SCs. So what happens is that the dependence on the totem pole leaders therefore goes down. This is deeper than just getting uh, these 10 leaders who make the headlines and if they leave, uh, it, it, we should not automatically assume that when these leaders leave, the entire OBC base will go. Some of it will go, yes, but not all of it. And, and that, that is the big, big difference, qualitatively. Now, my next question is on the economies. You know, you've also said Modi is the new Nehru. I assume you may mean in his economic outlook and not on his uh, secular outlook, so to speak. Um, so, so what I, when I said that, uh, look, this is a very counterintuitive argument to make because Modi and Nehru are exact opposite sides of the ideological yeah. divide. Uh, Nehru is a great hate figure in the lexicon of the right. Uh, so let me explain what I mean by the comparison. I did not lexicon mean of the that, left. Yeah, uh, he's, he's a Nehru of the left. Uh, uh, he's a new Nehru of the right. That's what I meant. And on for five reasons, and I'll come to the economic point. The first is that even though their ideologies are very different, um, one, they are both. They were both absolutely unambiguous about the ideals that they embody. Nehru single-handedly fought opposition from the right wing. From the his biggest battle was not with Jansang or with the RSS or with the uh, Hindu Mahasabha. His biggest battle was with the right wingers within his own Congress. And we've shown that he was even forced to resign at one point as Prime Minister because of that. Mr. Modi, when he won his 2019 triumph, he said in his victory speech that we are unambiguous about. It. I mean, he said it very clearly. That's one. Including on the question of secularism, Mr. Modi makes no bones about it, including uh, including on the question of secularism and definitions of that. That's number two. Third, I think, um, just as Nehru marked a radical break with the India before, you know, his famous twist with destiny speech, I think to Mr. Modi's followers, 
he this idea of new new india this idea of new bharat this offers a vision of an india whether you agree with it or not which was side of the political divide you're on which is fundamentally different from the consensus that has prevailed on on the idea of india over all these years and therefore i think is a radical break and and because of the stature that he enjoys politically um it is comparable to nehru on the economic question and this is the interesting one uh, when mr modi comes to power a lot of people see him a lot of people in the middle classes support modi also because they see him as some kind of a new margaret thatcher as a new ronald reagan bringing in these new kinds of reforms in the last 7 8 years i mean we've seen the new budget and there've been some ideas on that uh, but in the last 7 8 years in fact the signature tune uh, uh, and we've seen the disinvestment of air india now as well but overall the signature the thematic of mr modi's economics has been a real doubling down on the creation of a welfare state with direct benefit transfers and things like that just as nehru saw economics as a way of bringing the poor out of uh, uh, fundamentally as a way of bring the poor out of poverty mr modi's economics is exactly that in fact i have argued in my chapter on economics says that it's more left than the left and that's i think that there's a commonality on that In fact, the Labharthis are actually turning out to be his biggest vote base in terms of making sure the direct benefits really reach the people. But uh, in terms of um, you know the RSS uh, point of view, also the politics of it, uh, Modi is clearly delivering on all that the RSS wants. But uh, there is also a feeling that you know this autocratic Modi is that also what the RSS wants because RSS doesn't want to let go of control of the BJP also. so i think uh, the rss uh, uh, bjp question is is you know uh, there is umb- an umbilical cord right if you if you like and i've got three chapters looking at the rss bjp question the representation of rss uh, uh, numerically in in the ministers both the state level government and the union government um, i think look i think the power equation between the bjp and the rss has shifted significantly uh, in elections in the past uh, the uh, bjp was inordinately dependent on rss cadres for mobilization what mr modi has done is that he's built a cadre uh, uh, under his leadership and with amit shah as the party president and and thereafter they have built a cadre which is unprecedented in the democratic world it, it is higher bigger than the chinese communist party the chinese communist party is a one party state um, uh, uh, where you you can't be member of any other party in india and even at the height of mr modi's triumph over 65% people even 29 2019 did not vote for the bjp in a country like that when you have such high cadre mobilization and such a high uh, uh, membership uh, it means that your dependence on the rss cadres even though ideologically you know you share a common vision you uh, there, there is a commonality of many things their dependence on the rss has gone back in fact the rss had a huge crisis of membership in the early 2000s uh, we've tracked the numbers of rss growth uh, when uh, under mr vajpayee's prime ministership and what's happened is there has been an uptick of rss membership from 2013 onwards if you map chart it on a graph the worm starts going up um but the bjp's dependence on rss for getting the last mile voter out has gone down one in fact the other way around in fact the rss member i spoke to a lot of rss leaders there's been an uptick in states like karnataka in in up in rss membership and many people are coming to rss now because they want to be close to the closer to the center of power right the most worried uh, in fact one one <laughs> pran pracharak told ahead ahead of a pran told me from my rss that you know my biggest worry is that every day these new members come i want you know my challenge is to see how many of them are coming us coming to us for our ideology and for the long term and how many will will defect immediately or leave once we lose power or once the bjp loses power isn't more the new congress now and i think you do uh, you have that phrase somewhere is bjp the new congress now so i think um, uh, the the amount of mobilization the bjp see they've built 522 offices uh, they've bought land and built 522 offices in uh, uh, dis- it, 522 districts between 2014 and 19 uh, the bjp has uh, and by the way the membership drives were launched not before the elections but after the elections so after the big the, the two biggest membership drives which which made it the single largest party in the world the first was launched a few months after the the triumph of 2014 the second was launched a few months after the 2019 triumph so the bjp has used this this time to build cadre and what i have shown is that this is cadre mobilization and party building on a scale that has not been seen in india since the pre independence congress in fact the bjp's dominance today Uh, and i'm not talking about the number of seats they have and all of that i'm talking about boots on the ground party structures cadre building that is is comparable only to the 50s congress number 1 you know the congress started declining in the 70s but it took a very long time 
for that to per percolate down into real you know the kind of congress that we are seeing today uh, and with the rise of mandal first and so on and so forth but this bjp has built strength in a way that um uh, they, they've built a structure which we, which is a lot of see mr modi has led this uh, he still brings a very strong premium to the bjp uh, uh, in terms of voters and so on but there is an easy liberal assumption that in a post modi era when we, once mr modi is gone this whole thing will collapse this is a black swan event that i don't think my, that's true that was going to be my question that can they sustain it because this is a one person model uh, the model works around him you know can it be sustained in a post modi era i have my doubts it's convince me that it's not so no so so look um uh, i don't have a crystal ball but i do think based on the research that i've done and come and i've talked to a lot of other party members and we traveled especially in up and karnataka and so on see there is no question that mr modi brings a premium to the party when uh, in a post modi era a lot of people who are with bjp because of modi some of them will drift away you know you can have losses here and there the point i do make is the structures they have built are 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 much stronger than one thinks it's not just personality based because of two or three reasons because of the new social coalitions they have built and they have been inserted at every level of the party not just at the top for building potemkin kind of villages when the do nita chalega to puri community chale jayegi aisa nahi hai and because of the beneficiaries now you will have an have a downturn yes but i think this is much more durable than 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 one thinks in the nalanda they are building yes they are building cadre they are building boats they are putting that but what about building leadership you know advani was known for building that second generation leadership i don't see that happening in modi's bjp at all so i think uh, uh, that's a very interesting question priya so you know the bjp as you said always had these six state level satraps uh, vasundhara raje in rajasthan uh, Uh, Kalyan Singh earlier, Uma Bharati, then Shivraj Singh Prasad, uh, Shivraj Singh Chauhan, who is still the Chief Minister uh, uh, of Madhya Pradesh. Um, uh, if you look at the BJP's uh, state leaders, uh, Chief Ministers now, uh, very few of them can win elections on their own. I mean, uh, uh, in, in the current uh, BJP ruled states. However, you look at a leader like Yogi Adityanath. Uh, Yogi Adityanath is a five-time MP from Gorakhpur. In, in this election, if they win UP, he'll be the first. And that's an if. It's a big if. if they win up uh, he will be the first chief minister a sitting chief minister in up who's come back for for a uh, for a term not even go with balnapa you could do that congress came back to pass successive times but with different chief ministers he's he's very young is in his in his 40s yogi adityanath to my mind I, i i think you're right there is a there is a problem of a second rung and third rung and building that cadre is one thing but you also have to get both casters but there is a reason why yogi adityanath is the single most uh a uh, in demand leader in all election campaign by the bjp after Mo modi and after amit shah in every state uh, and this is i'm talking about every election in the last 3 uh, to 4 years since he became chief minister uh, and that is a good reflection because the leaders in demand are based on what the local party leadership thinks is required uh, will get us votes if he wins he's he's 49 or uh, uh, now he's got another 20 years of politics ahead of him i think he is where mr modi today uh, uh he is today where mr modi was in 2007 2008 where you had uh, he, he had a very strong base in gujarat many people in the even, even in the bjp had a, uh, you know were, had problems with it the middle classes outside gujarat were, were not with him uh, the corporate classes were not with him but that discourse changed after the 2000 election and and started from, uh, from 2012 12 to uh, 2009 2010 onwards i think this election campaign in up is significantly important for the future of the bjp as well and again it's a very open question but it it is a, it is a question yes so i totally agree with you there on that point but uh, that's just one person one leader and who's also come up because of his own making not because you know we know there is a fight for between him and amit shah and modi they don't want to promote him he got promoted because of various other reasons maybe the rss so given to themselves left to themselves modi and shah don't they want ciphers they want a piyush goel they want a nirmala sitaraman you know person who cannot win elections without their blessings who are dependent on the rajya sabha route that's the kind of bjp they want they don't want this strong satraps i think that is uh, that is definitely a critique of the bjp currently um uh, um to go forward you have to build leaders that will be vote catchers on their own uh, but i think if you if in the if you look at the current permanent uh, the next general election is going to be fought under the leadership of narendra modi by the bjp in 2024 there's no question about that so they have some time to sort out the the, the question of the next gen leadership is still 2 3 4 years ahead 
Um, and, and, and that's a question the BJP must resolve. Question to you is uh, Nalan, is it a new BJP or is it Modi and Advani's BJP on Testeron? Because you know they've just hyped up the Hindutva, they have expanded the base a bit uh, to you know, in fact, each chapter of yours deals with the fact how they've all been working on the, with the women's issues, whether on welfareism, whether on OBCs, uh, then uh, how they've actually used social media and other means to propagate, but it's Still, the old BJP, which has been hyped up, is it or is it? So, uh, so you know, I, I've I've thought a lot. That's a good question, Priya, and I've thought a lot about this. Uh, my view is that the Hindutva look. There is no question. This is absolutely unambiguous about uh, about uh, hardline Hindutva. There's no question about that, right? But the fact of the matter is that the BJP has won more elections than it has lost wow. since 2014, both at the union and at the state levels, or done better in as opposed to uh, than before, than they did earlier, right? Now, that is not happening because of Hindutva alone, because Hindutva, uh, you know, all studies will tell you 17-18% vote is Hindutva. That's the hardline vote. Be, you ha- they are getting other kinds of voters which are enabling these victories or these advances. Now, in fact, one of the, uh, um, you know, somebody in Yogi Adhanath's office who I spoke to, who spoke on the, of the record, he actually gave me a very nice, interesting line. He said, Dekhi, Hindutva to uh, gati deta hai. The fact is that um, people are coming to the BJP outside of the core voter because they are finding something for it. People vote for various reasons, whether it's because of caste, whether it's for welfare. And it's a complex thing, right? It can't be reduced to one. I think what happens is that because the, the wedge of Hindutva is so prominent and it dominates the daily debate and on and polarization helps the BJP, no question about it. And it dominates t- t- TV channels and so on. We think that it's a one-trick pony, but it's not. It, people are coming to it for multiple reasons. I'll give you one example. On welfare, uh, the direct benefit transfer system, which has revolutionized uh, welfare spending in this country, was not the BJP's idea. It was Manmohan Singh's idea. It started uh, uh, as a pilot project on 1st January t- uh, 2013. Jairam Ramesh was the rural affairs minister. They piloted it in 51 districts. There were lots of problems. Uh, this was enabled by Aadhaar and the mobile phone revolution and so on. By the time they got it right, the Congress lost power. Mr. Modi comes to power, his genius was in realizing how important this is. And look at the numbers. Between in 2013-14, direct benefit transfers were enabled only for 28 schemes. By 2018-19, they were enabled, enabled for 434 schemes. The beneficiaries uh, and went up by 44 times, either both in terms of the money spent and the beneficiaries. The money spent went up 44 times and the beneficiaries went up by 7 times in, in those 5 years. But this is not enough because all governments spend money. Uh, the BJP benefited from a technology coming together for welfare spending. All governments spend money on, on, on welfare spending. What the BJP did was it politically used the welfare list to, to build these Labarthi Sambhalans to tell people, ki, look, ye aapko mil rahe, hum de rahe. and that mobilization has helped it. You said, you know, I agree with you. Yes, they've expanded their vote base for various reasons. But what about abandoning their vote base? The Baniyas, the Brahmins are feeling a bit sidelined. But the Baniyas, definitely, the traders, the, you know, the small manufacturers, all the decisions they've taken have actually attacked them, whether it is demonetization, whether it's that very unwieldy GST. So uh, why are they abandoning this class? That That's a very good question, uh, Priya. And in fact, you know, I'm, I'm reminded a little bit about that Um, um by the way, uh, in Yogi Adityanath's government, um, currently when we looked at the social matrix of that, and there are always, obviously always this question of Thakur Raj in UP, right? Um, and so on. Um, there are more Brahmin ministers than there are Thakur ministers. There are more OBC ministers than there are uh, Thakur ministers. But you know, numbers can only tell you a partial picture, right? Um, on the question of uh, um, Baniyas, you are absolutely right. After demonetization, monetization, there was a lot of pain. Um, in fact, a lot of BJP supporters I speak to, in fact, some of them who fund the BJP uh, at local levels, uh, they have been very unhappy about this move to the formalization of the economy and so on because it's broken the business model or made, made them change. But it eventually it reminds me of, you know, I sense this in Gujarat in the 2017 election where some of the biggest anger with the BJP was among the Patels who were the biggest supporters of BJP. And, and, and you know, I was on a bus journey. We were traveling to Surat in a bus to get a sense of the flavor. And we had this strong conversation on the bus where every half the guys in the bus were Patels and they were abusing the BJP. So I said, finally, I asked them, Achha, okay, fine. Uh, will you vote against them? Uh, he said, Dekhi, bahut galat kaam kiya hai, sab kiya hai. Lekin jab hum voting booth mein jayenge, so, heart pe button mein na, dil hai. 
in, in comparison to the lotus so eventually whether this anger translates into a conversion to voting for akhilesh is a question nalan just before i let you go quick uh, thing on how, what made you how long did it take for you to research write this book of course being a journalist i'm sure that was part of the plan but uh, how did the idea come about and how long did it take so uh, thanks priya i mean of course i've tracked uh, the bjp and mr modi for over 20 years now so it's always been i mean a lot of that comes in the book but fundamentally the idea of the book was born sometime around 2017 in december around the gujarat elections when my colleague rishab who's a, i think the most kick ass data journalist i know uh, he showed me these uh, mind blowing dashboards uh, combining economic and uh, micro level political data which completely blew my mind and it it didn't align we are all political junkies right we all have a sense of what's happening on the ground at least we think we have when i saw those those data dashboard it was completely opposite to what my perception was and i thought there's something it made me think so then we went to the ground to test it out and it which was born out that this is actually happening on the ground is not just on some data set which is partial or misleading we tested it out again in karnataka in the elections of 2018 and then in the five states of the hindi heartland in 2020 2018 in december and then we said okay now there is something much deeper here that needs to be investigated um and by the way 80 90% of what's in the book um i did not know before i started writing and that surprised me in fact a lot of the findings i didn't believe myself when i first saw them so we therefore we tested it at three sets it and traveled a lot to recheck it on the ground um first so the actual writing i began uh, so we did all of that till 2019 the actual writing i began after the 2019 election results so it took two years Thank you so much for this book, and wish you all the best with it. I know it's going to do really well. I certainly, for one, enjoy reading it. Thank you so much, Nalin, for this. Thank you very much, Kiran. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.